So I really hate it when I'm given two options, but both of the options are really, really bad options. They're really terrible options. You ever get put into a position like that? Hey, Rick, do you want liver for dinner or would you rather balance the checkbook? Ugh, two really terrible options for me. Hey, Rick, would you rather play a game of Monopoly, which will last three hours, or would you rather get a case of COVID-19? Ugh, tough choice. I'm not really sure which one I would go with. Okay, so some of those options might not be all that bad for you. Maybe you love playing Monopoly, for instance. But this option, these two options, might be terrible for us all. Hey, you, if you were the pastor of the church, would you rather ignore and avoid saying anything about the assault on the Capitol by the rioters? Or would you rather say something that risks offending the political sensibilities of Trinity members and friends. Which one are you gonna go for? Now, luckily, we are people who call ourselves Christians. And so I can trust that our allegiance, as we're talking to one another right now, our allegiance is not to a person or to a party, or to a sports team, but rather it's to a Lord, and a Messiah, and a Savior, that pushes us to recognize that we need something to be saved from. Each one of us has something in which we then say, I recognize that, and I need a Messiah. I need a Savior to save me. A Savior who is neither worried about offending anyone. Have you noticed that about Jesus? He doesn't give two hoots about offending somebody, but he does it in love. Nor is he worried about loving us and somehow losing himself in that love so much that he's afraid to speak the truth. Jesus always holds those two things in balance. So here goes. Here goes an attempt to invite the truth and God's love into our conversation, into this sermon, if you will. Wish me luck. First of all, God judges us most harshly, it seems to me, when we get our loves out of order. Our loves what order is love supposed to be in, according to Scripture, according to Jesus? Number one is the love of God. It's the first commandment. Jesus undergirds that. So first love, if you want to get them in order, the right order, is to love God. The second order of love is to love the person in need. Um, Jesus calls this our neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, the lawyer says, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan who helps the person in need. His, the love of the person in need takes precedence over his own agenda, his own prejudice, his own schedule, uh, the things he wants for himself. He sets that aside and loves his neighbor, the person in need. So love of God, love of the person in need. Number three is to love your family, your friends, your enemies, um, those who support a different political party than you, those who irritate us to no end. That's the third level of love. And the fourth level of love, as I read it, is to love ourselves. And it's important that we love ourselves, because that brings us back up to loving our neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? So God, neighbor, 
family, friends, enemies, people who irritate us, blah, 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 and self. But we love ourself so that we can then love our neighbor in the same way. But when we get those loves out of order, everything gets messed up. So when we put nationalism, our country, when we insert that at the top of the slot, when we put a president at the top of the slot, when we put somebody famous, an actor, or somebody who is very rich at the top of the slot, when we put a fear that we have, or a disappointment, or a hurt, or a grief, or a loss, whenever we put something else at the top of the list, we push God not just down, we push God out of our life. Because there's only one top slot. And you can't, by definition, put God in another slot other than number one. You can't put God in number two, otherwise God's not in any slot. That's just the way the order of love works. When we put something in the first slot and we say, this is the most important thing, I would riot in the capital for this one. I would kill somebody for this one. I would chant that I'm going to do something horrible to somebody because I'm putting them in the top slot. When we do that, we lose God. There's no other way around it. We lose God. Well, I don't, I have to say, I don't think we actually, we actually lose God. We don't have the strength or the power or the ability to, to send God away or, or bring God close to us. No, we don't have that. But by losing God, what I mean to say is we end up losing the ability to see him at work in our life. We lose the ability to have his love and his light and his power lead the way for us. We end up not able to love one another and our loves get out of order. I think that's the danger of forgetting who God is. God is not the one who comes into our life to support our prioritizing of whatever love we want on the list. God is the one who comes into our life to remind us that only he can be at the top slot. And when we put another person or fear or whatever ideology there, we lose God completely. Number two, conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories get traction when we put when we get mixed up between the truth and our opinion about the truth, that's when conspiracy theories gain power. When we get those two things mixed up, when we think that our opinion about the truth, what we want to accomplish and what we want and what we desire is the truth, and we're willing to replace the actual truth with that, that's when conspiracy theories do damage. These go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Really, these conspiracy theories. Who, who, who sinned here? Well, there's a lot of finger pointing back then. Adam said, Eve, Eve did it. Eve. Eve said, no, it wasn't me. It was the serpent. It was the, it was the snake. It was the temptation that did it, right? Conspiracy theories go all the way back to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the golden calf, how Mary got pregnant with her son Jesus, and on and on and on. The danger of conspiracy theories is that they try to bend the truth toward what we want. And so we get our loves out of order.
<laughs> That's the way it works. And we forget that the truth is God himself. We don't say that there is a truth. We talk about who is the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So our God is the truth. In today's gospel, Jesus says that he saw Nathanael under a fig tree. Did you catch that in the reading of the gospel? Kind of strange, isn't it? Nathanael said, where'd you get to know me? And Jesus said, I saw you before Philip called you. You were under the fig tree. That has a big effect on Nathanael. But do you remember the leaves that Adam and Eve used to cover up their nakedness after they realized that they had sinned and gone against God's word? The leaves that they used to cover up themselves when they got their order of love wrong, <laughs> when they trusted in the temptation and in the, in the eating of the fruit that they shouldn't eat, and they didn't listen to God? Yep, they covered up with fig leaves. It was a sign of sin, fig leaves were. So God doesn't come to us and bless us and show us mercy. He doesn't do that when we show great strength, when we show great violence and we riot toward the capital. He doesn't even show us God's blessings don't come to us when we get everything in our lives together, right? When we come out on the winning side. That's not when God blesses us. But rather, God blesses us when we become aware of our sins, our humanness, our brokenness, our shortcomings, our imperfections, whatever you want to call them. That's when God blesses us. When we recognize our sins, when we confess our sins. There is an incredible power when we can say to God and to one another, I'm sorry, I was wrong. That is the place of blessing. That is the place of reconciliation. That's where justice can take root. To recognize our own weakness is the beginning of faith in God. A confession that leads to life and love and forgiveness and mercy and eternal life. All of that. As followers of Jesus, we know, don't we, that violence is always wrong? Don't we get that? You can't say, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm going to pick up the sword and lop off the ear of the soldier, or I'm going to take a fire extinguisher and throw it at the head of a police officer. Do you remember that's what Peter did in the garden when they came to arrest Jesus? He took the sword out and he cut the ear off of the soldier. And how did Jesus respond to that? Jesus did two things. Jesus immediately spoke against it and said, put the sword away. But then he didn't stop there. He reached his hand out and put it on the ear of the soldier, and he healed him. My God, that's our example of how God works. Violence is always wrong, whether it's in a Black Lives Movement gathering or whether it's in white conspiracy Nazi rioters that break into the Capitol at the invitation of our president. It's always wrong.
sometimes we just have to speak up, don't we? And recognize that when something's wrong, it's wrong. We have to say it. We can speak up. And God calls us to speak up when we see violence and racism. When we see lies being spoken over and over and over again. When we see other ugly behavior, God calls us to speak up. I'll tell you, I really feel guilty sometimes. I feel guilty for the times that I failed to speak up. In the name of my faith in Christ, I've let some of you down. But like many of you, there are worries that I might offend somebody. I might offend their sensibilities or their loyalties. <clears throat> Please forgive me. That's my invitation to you. Please forgive me. I was wrong and I'm sorry for not speaking up sooner. But my struggle, of course, is that I love you. And how do you risk hurting or upsetting the people that you love? The people that you care for? The people that you want to be happy? When do you risk me being misunderstood or even vilified? When do you risk somebody walking away from you and losing a friendship? Can you talk to a U of M Michigan fan about loving Ohio State? Or can you tell a Packers fan that Brett Favre was just kind of an average quarterback? But maybe, just maybe, we are obligated to care for one another and keep our loves in order. Maybe, just maybe, we are obligated to care for one another and part of that caring is speaking the truth. Not our opinion of the truth. Not the truth from the stance of a really committed Michigan or Ohio State fan. Not speaking the truth out of blind loyalty, but the truth of Jesus Christ. What does that look like for you? What line needs to be crossed before you speak up and say, that was wrong? What line needs to be crossed before you suspend attacking the other side because they do it too. But recognize that you've gotten it wrong. At what point do you say, I'm sorry, I was wrong? God's truth always begins when we start with our own failings. If you're starting to explain this situation with the capital or any other situation in your life, and you're starting by pointing out the failings of somebody else, you're missing the point. You're not putting your loves in order, not in the correct order. Our faith in God, the truth of God, always begins when you and I can start with our own failings and then move into the mercy and the compassion of our God. Amen.